Uh, you'd uh, bless uh, uh, Brother Peacock probably speaking right now or at least wrapping it up. And I do pray that you'd uh, bless the camp time uh, for the folks there. I ask you to help us to understand your words and to be faithful to your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, going through the book of Acts, it's a transition book uh, from the Jews to the Gentiles, from Israel to the church. Uh, and up until this time, still the Jews or the disciples or the apostles are believing that um, they still have an opportunity to uh, witness the rapture or be a part of that because uh, they asked in Acts 1-6 about the kingdom. And so uh, up until this time, there is still that opportunity depending upon how many uh, Jewish people accept uh, the Messiah. And so uh, they have pooled their resources financially, uh, which is really not a good idea to do, but they did it. Okay, It's never commanded in the Bible. Uh, but they pull their resources, and in chapter 6, we can see that some folks are grumbling because they're not getting what they think they should. Okay, and so, uh, you know, in any society, you know, I read this article of this part that Hillary is going to help redistrib- redistribute the wealth from the wealthy to the middle class. Oh, well, that's so nice that's for her. Of course, she's not the wealthy. She's just common like everybody else. Uh, redistribution is a nice way of saying theft. That's all that that is. Taken from one, given to another, buying a vote. And uh, both Democrats and Republicans think the same way on this, where the Democrats want to be control of about 90% of it, and the Republicans want control of about 60% of it. Uh, they're both wrong. Okay, and so whenever you pool your money, I remember being in Israel, we went to what was called a kibbutz, and a kibbutz is a voluntary um, group of people who pool their resources together, live in this community. They'll have a head over it. Uh, and then the people kind of bring their monies in there. And when I was on that tour of Israel, uh, we met with the leader of this kibbutz. It was in the Golan Heights. And a couple of these Americans thought, oh, I think that's a good idea. And isn't it working wonderful? And the guy kind of said, uh, well, uh, <laughs> We have our lazy folks, too. <laughs> and so that was the, the head guy. And so uh, in chapter 6, we have some griping at the beginning. Okay, so chapter 6, verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, okay, they went from 120 to 3,000 to 5,000, and who knows how big it's getting now. Uh, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, so they still have racial tension. You're never going to get away from that. Okay, the, the greatest uh, person to overcome racial differences is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, he is the greatest. Uh, putting aside our differences never works, it never will work. Uh, man in his natural state, birds of a feather flock together. That's just a normal, natural thing that happens. Okay, and so... Uh, the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So their widows, the, the Greeks, so the Gentiles' widows, they felt they weren't getting enough. Okay, and they're probably saying all oh, the apostles and Jews are taking care of them and not us. Okay, verse 12. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them. Didn't call everybody, just the disciples. Okay, the select ones who are studying with them. Uh, Jesus had 12 apostles, 70 disciples, so I'm not sure of the numbers here. And so these are the ones that are really uh, serious, zealous, studying with the apostles. So they called that group together and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Okay, they're not being arrogant about this. I doubt, I, I don't believe, see that. I don't see that they think that it's beneath them to do that. It's just a matter of priority. And the matter of priority is that the apostles were given the unique uh, gifts and they were given uh, the inside track on the, uh, the doctrines that God was giving to them as they're transitioning through. And so they needed... Uh, to be teaching uh, the majority of the time. And they didn't need to be running around, you know, passing out the little, the rice or whatever to the the widows. So they're going to seek some help. So the disciples thought this was a good idea. 
And verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. So that's what they're looking for is honesty. I don't know why, but for some reason the New Bibles don't like the word honesty. A lot of them take it out. In many cases, I think the word occurs about ten times, and I think they take it out about seven of the ten. Okay, but uh, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Okay, the business of financially uh, helping out uh, anybody when they need it done. Okay, so seven men, you would tend to think that's kind of, that's not enough. If you've got uh, 3,000, 5,000, you know, uh, 8,000 or more people, boy, that's, that, you don't seem like that's enough. But uh, maybe they're just delegating it and then sending them out. Uh, these are commonly called deacons, even though the word's not there. Uh, but uh, that seems to be the foundation for that. And what they want there is honesty, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. Okay, that's what they were looking for. And according to 1 Timothy 3, that's uh, obviously what we should be looking for also. Uh, in verse 4, this is what the apostles were going to give themselves to. They were going to give themselves continually to prayer, continuing instant in prayer, Romans 12 says. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, uh, pray without ceasing. And the ministry of the word, okay, ministering the word of God, teaching the word of God. Uh, to uh, the people coming into the church. Okay, the ministry of the word itself. Okay, that idea of the word of God, if you would look in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. First Timothy 5, 17. And uh, to study, uh, that is technically the number uh, one priority of the apostles. And it would be the number one priority of a pastor or preacher is to study. Okay, study the word. He ought to be laboring in the word. Uh, it, was, it was a real blessing. When I went to this camp, I didn't really know anybody there, you know, except for, you know, our kids. And so I walked up, and the preacher, he says, are you Pastor Hoffman? I said, yeah. He said, I got your Bible. <laughs> oh, that breaks the ice. That's nice. <laughs> And another one says, I got your Bible. And then I saw this one young fellow, he had the blue box. And I said, oh, where'd you get that? Oh, I got that online. Oh, I said, I could have sold it to you cheaper on our website rather than that website. <laughs> but uh, it's a real, it was a real blessing to see that. And uh, uh, the preacher asked if I'd take trades. You know, he's got the first edition. I said, I got a third edition. He said, you take trades? I said, you probably want to keep your notes in there. He said, yeah, I do. I said, I'll just give you one. So <laughs> I gave him Bible. So that was nice. Um, but um, what we're supposed to do is 1 Timothy 5.17. It says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay, so laboring in the word, studying in the word. Unfortunately, the Christian colleges aren't doing that anymore. Uh, I went through five years of Christian college, two years at uh, Grace College, uh, three, three and a half years at Hiles Anderson, got out into work, and I discovered, um, hmm, I didn't know the book. I knew practical things of the ministry, but I did not know anything outside of baptistic doctrines. That's, that's all I was limited with, uh, or shall we say the fundamentals. That's all I knew. And when you get out and, and start witnessing the people, they're going to throw a question at you. But what we were taught in a soul winning class is don't answer the questions. Stick right on the Romans road. Okay, but, you know, that don't work. Okay, because people have questions. Now, if they're going to be a smart aleck about it, then, okay, then don't take time to answer those. You can check the spirit by their, their attitude. Okay, but uh, some people need... Uh, one time we was in Leroy, that big metropolis of Leroy, Leroy uh, a friend and I. And okay, our spiel was, knock on the door when they answer, hi, my name is, his name is, we're from First Baptist Church Hammond, and we'd like to ask you a question. If you die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven when you die? Okay, and I pulled that in Gary one of the first times, and a guy, after he heard it, he said, I've heard that before, <laughs> slam. I said, okay, I'll have to try something and not be a robot. Well, I got this lady in, in, in uh, Leroy that 
I said, I don't got time. I said, okay, I understand. Can I read you one Bible verse, one or two Bible verses? She said, you can read me that. And I just read her Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I said, there's something for you to think about. And we walked away. And my soul went in guy says, well, that was a good idea. What would you come up with that? I said, well, I don't know. I just write on the spot. <laughs> you've got to get outside of this little uh, you know, salesman approach. Because that's all we were doing is salesman approach. You know, trying to get him a sign on a dotted line, spiritually speaking. And uh, like Brother Dan Bardwell says, I think that's gospel vaccination. You give them enough gospel that they don't get the gospel. And you can knock on doors from here, the kingdom come up in the Hammond area, and you'll talk to people and say, well, I've done that already. Well, I've done that already. Well, you reading your Bible? No. You going to church? No. But I've done that. I'm going to heaven because I did that. I prayed that. So I got so tired of that. Um, and, of course, being a house Anna, she had to go every single week. I, I told Jan, I said, I'm going to take you someplace where I guarantee nobody's ever knocked on these doors. So we went down to Ramsey's Landing. Okay, Ramsey's Landing right there on the Kankakee River. First door, they had a watchtower thing and a door, so nobody was home. I pulled that out and put our track in. And the second door, I knocked on that door, and I told her who we were, and she said, you Baptists are everywhere. I said, did you just move here? She said, yeah. I said, for where? Gary. I said, oh, ridiculous. <laughs> and we knocked at the doors and came across an old classmate and talked to her for a while and then knocked on the door and came across some guy who said he was a hermit and he talked our ears off for about an hour and a half. I like to talk to people. And then... <laughs> Man, oh man, fella. <laughs> okay, and uh, but uh, we're supposed to labor in the word. I realized after five years of Christian education, I was not taught the Bible. I was taught practical things, spiritual things, some good thing, many good things. The great Bible teacher at Hiles Anderson, who preached behind this pulpit a few times is now serving a jail sentence in Tennessee for 108 years. And his wife is serving a sentence of 58 years for the abuse of an adopted child. 400 scars on her body. I mean, if half of it wasn't true, you still have 200 scars on her body. That was the Bible teacher, the number one Bible teacher, Hiles Anderson, and this was going on when they were at that school. And it's just amazing. Just amazing. That man, in, in one class, he got talking about the resurrection. And he said, harvest is like a resurrection, and so corn plants are like a resurrection. He said, do you know how many ears of corn are in a stalk? I raised my hand and said, yeah, one. He goes, oh, you city slickers, you don't know anything. There's five or six. Tim Coleman sat in front of me. He's now a pastor in Phoenix. He turned around and said, I thought there was only one. I walked through a cornfield and only saw one. I said, yeah, there's only one. You don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I don't know if he's thinking of Indian corn, or I think sometimes they'll have more than one, but most time you just have one, or one might be a sucker, what's called a sucker. It looks like an ear, but it's not an, it doesn't have any corn on there. So, oh, well, that's how it goes. 2 Timothy 2.15, uh, obviously... Uh, the verse that was the key verse for Awana for many years until they dumped the King James, and then that messed up their verse. And that study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Bible's got proper divisions. So those two letters, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, are, are to preachers where we are to study. Uh, the Bible also gives us um, techniques of delivering sermons. Uh, in it's funny in the colleges they they call it techniques of interpretation they call that hermeneutics it's a funny why they chose that word hermeneutics the god herms was a greek pagan god why would you want to call the study of the bible after a greek pagan god is that weird 
And then the word they call for the art of preaching is homiletics, or in short, a homily. So the Catholic priests will usually give a homily. Okay, but in our Bible, the Bible shows how to prepare a sermon and how to deliver a sermon by the book called Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is 12 chapters. The word preacher is found seven times in the, in the, the uh, book. Uh, you'll notice that the writer or the deliverer of the sermon, the preacher, has a theme. His theme is vanity of vanities, all of vanities. And he has about six or seven or eight, I think in this case, ten points that he shows that vanity is vanities. He draws a conclusion at the end of it, chapter 12, verse 13. He don't read the poem. Uh, he just draws a conclusion. And he tries to bring people to a decision. And that's what preaching is. It's interesting. Ecclesiastes... If you drop the last, I think, three or four letters is a word called ekklesia, and that's so-called a Greek word for the word church, and that's in the Old Testament. Boy, God has some interesting ways of showing things. Okay, and so uh, in Ecclesiastes, we have the Bible method of declaring or teaching the Bible. He shows us how to do it. In Nehemiah chapter 8, there's first eight verses, he shows the technique uh, for or the method for a public service. Now, we don't follow it it exactly, and I don't think you'd appreciate it if we did, because they take one-fourth part of the day, three hours reading the Bible, and then one-fourth part of the day explaining it. That's six-hour service. So that'd be... (laughs) I don't think I could handle that myself. Okay, but still, the idea, the basic idea is that they had a speaker, and in Nehemiah 8, verse 8, if you want to look at that, this, is, this would be uh, an example when he does it right. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. It's a three-part thing, and I think it's kind of interesting that in a <clears throat> wonderful reference Bible, it occurs on page 777. And on page 666 is a chapter 13. And uh, that's all coincidence. I say that coincidence is when God wants to remain anonymous. Okay, Nehemiah 8, verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. So number one, read passages in the Bible and gave the sense. Gave the sense. That means uh, someone said, now that makes sense. Okay, and cause them to understand the reading. So they're actually, notice they're focusing on the words, where, like we do. Read a text, come back to the text, give illustrations or analogies to explain the text, hoping that we understand what we read when we go out the door. And that, that last phrase, that's what the Bible calls inspiration. To understand. It's when the Spirit illuminates our minds so we might understand the words. If we go strictly with Job 32.8, the definition. So, like a farmer once said to me, he's after he, he, the church he attended, the preacher always used these $50 words. And after hearing me, he said, well, at least I don't have to have a dictionary to understand you. And that's good. And when I did the truck stop ministry years ago, I I can't tell you how many people that sat in that little chapel service, we'd have anywhere from 2 to 6, maybe 11 one time, that they said, I have learned more Bible just here in 30 to 45 minutes that I have in my entire life. And the reason why is I just talk straight to them, straight and plain, uh, no big fancy words, and they understood when they walked out the door, what was to be stated. Now, any of us remember uh, going through Fundamental Baptist, basically, like in Hammond, they'd have Johnny Colston read the text, and this is the text verse in your Schofield Reference Bible, turn to page number. And, And then you can shut your Bible. In fact, Hiles would tell people, shut the Bible and listen to me. I mean, he'd actually tell them to close it. I wouldn't do it, listen to them. If I wanted to write something down, I'd write it down. 
But, I mean, and it really wouldn't be part of the text what they're re- from they're preaching from. And the reason why is they only looked at the Bible from an instructional, motivational viewpoint. That's the only way they looked at the Bible. They looked at no zero doctrine unless by chance they stumbled across, across Baptistic doctrine. And that's, that, unfortunately, is a fundamentalist way. Okay, so verse 4, ministry of the word. Okay, verse 5, uh, we have something very interesting in verses 5 through 9. Uh, and it's going to show the basic uh, argument within uh, Christianity. Okay, in verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen. Okay, so he's the first man listed, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, okay, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Okay, that word Antioch, key word, very important word, first time that's found in the Bible, and notice that it is associated with spirit-filled deacons. So that is a good association, Antioch. That's called Antioch of Syria, where in the book of Acts, the transition is going from Jerusalem to Antioch. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, this is the first place the disciples were called Christians, in Antioch. In Acts chapter 13, this is where Paul and Barnabas went, and this is where the missionaries and Paul and Barnabas went out, and this is where the prophets went, and this is where uh, Bible teaching, evangelization began in Antioch. So it obviously has a very good connotation. So the manuscripts went from Jerusalem, the, Christ, the, uh, the scriptures went from Jerusalem up to Antioch. Now through the church time period, those manuscripts became known as Byzantine. And all the revivals that came up through Europe and then to America came through the Byzantine or the Antioch, or the Syrian manuscripts. That's the good family of manuscripts, okay? And the only Bible that you can find in a Christian bookstore that comes from those manuscripts, solely from those manuscripts, is the King James Bible. Okay, now there's another word in here. In verse 6, Whom they set before the apostles, when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, so great, praise the Lord, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Man, they're even getting Jewish priests, uh, Levites, changing over. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So this apostolic gifts were transferred to the deacons here, I guess you could say. But when you have something good going on, you're going to have opposition. So where is that coming from? Verse 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of uh, Sicilia, and of Asia, that's Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, disputing with Stephen, arguing with Stephen. So there's the opposition. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So there's the opposite. Who the opposite? The key word, about two-thirds into it, Alexandrians. That's Alexandria, Egypt. Those uh, copies of the manuscripts from Jerusalem went north to Antioch, and the Christians, the believers, faithfully translated those. Uh, first into the Syrian language, it's called the Peshuta Bible. Okay, then an old Latin Bible, then Martin Luther's old German Bible, and then uh, we have it in English. John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, okay, and, and then coming through there. That's the family, the lineage of the King James Bible. Okay, those, there's copies of the manuscripts that went down to Alexandria, Egypt. Okay, in the Bible it says over 70 times out of Egypt, over 80 times out of the land of Egypt, 10 times it calls Egypt the house of bondage. That sounds like a pretty bad definition from the Bible. 
Egypt was so bad that Joseph said, I don't want my bones staying here. Okay, and so that's a bad connotation. Alexandrians arguing with the Antioch. That's the two basic Bibles. That's the two basic arguments. What happened down in Antioch was a guy named Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N. I don't know if Oregon was named after this guy. Uh, he was an Arian. Uh, an Arian would be a modern-day Jehovah Witness. He did not believe Jesus Christ was God. He had a bunch of goofy ideas. He changed those words in that manuscript, which developed or created whole new manuscripts. And those manuscripts are known as Alexandrian manuscripts. And the two favorites of those are called Vaticanus Sinaiticus. Vaticanus, found in a Vatican library. Sinaiticus, found in a, in a monastery in Mount Sinai, the traditional Mount Sinai, that a Catholic woman named it Mount Sinai. Found him in a garbage can. Okay, Moody Bible Institute, a Protestant institution, and uh, Wheaton College, and all these other schools, uh, Maranatha Baptist Bible College, uh, all these Protestant schools think these two, the Vatican and Sinai, are the best ones. And they will yield to those two over 5,000 on the Antioch side. They'll yield to those two almost every time. And that's the argument. Now, the word Alexandria is found four times in the book of Acts, four times in the Bible, and in Acts 27, I think it's interesting that a ship from Alexandria sailed to Rome and had a shipwreck. So it goes from Alexandria, Egypt, to the Vatican City. So when you go to the Christian bookstore, even though they may have 20 different versions, there are two basic Bibles. One come from Antioch, King James Bible, and all the rest come from Alexandria. And they admit it when you push come to shove. Now, the new King James, they tried to put both of them together. And when you mix dirt with water, you get muddy water. And the new King James, that's why. And then they put the, the insignia 666 on the title page. Real intelligent. Okay, so that's the two basic arguments. And this is, uh, if you get in a discussion with somebody, all you have to do is ask them this question. If you had a choice to get you a Bible, a pure Bible from Israel that came through Antioch, or an impure Bible that goes through Alexandria, Egypt, which would you choose? Anybody, whenever I've asked that question many, many times, uh, one time I had a guy say Egypt, and then, then I went through, okay, 70 times, says out of Egypt, 80 times out of the land of Egypt. Egypt's called the house of bondage 10 times. What do you think now? He says, I suppose Antioch. <laughs> okay, so they will answer your argument. And then say, praise the Lord, you agree with me. That's why I got a King James. Do you want one? I traded so many guys to their newfangled versions for King James in a jail, you know, I had a big stack of them. I had so many of them. Started, you know, got rid of them, pitched them, got rid of them old junk stuff. So that's our two basic arguments. Now, if we take this further back in Bible history, this takes us all the way back to Cain and Abel. Your two basic religions. Cain is a religion of works. Abel is a religion of grace. Okay, and during the Inquisition, where the Vatican. Uh, was killing Protestants. What was that? That was Alexandria getting rid of Antioch. And that's the basic argument. Okay, so we see that right here in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 6, verse 5, first occurrence of Antioch. Acts 6, verse 9, first occurrence of Alexandria. And I like it where it says they disputed with Stephen, but I also like it more, verse 10, where they could not. They could not resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. And if you know the arguments, you will witness the same thing. The same, and it's amazing. It's amazing. When you deal with these people, in fact, you know, the more you deal with them, you can, uh, you know their arguments before they even speak it out of their mouth. In fact, you could tell them what they're going to say. Because they spew the same thing. So, since they could not resist, verse 10, 
will they join them? No, not in this case. What will they do? They will, will go to further lengths of wickedness against their faith to get rid of these ones from Antioch. Verse 11, then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people. And the elders and the scribes and came unto him and caught him and brought him to the council. So Stephen is going to be our first martyr. Okay, he's going to be a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, and set up false witnesses, just like Calvary, which said, this man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. That's right, he said that. And shall change the custom which Moses delivered to us. Now that's true. Change the customs. If they were very precise and listened to his words honestly, the customs of the Jewish laws were changing. What? The Sabbath the washing of the pots and pans, the ceremonial aspect, having the Levites a special priest. All those Ju Judaistic ceremonial aspects are put on hold and we're fading away because we're going into the church. The customs, not the moral aspect. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not bear false witness. That's repeated by the Apostle Paul. Those are still in force. The civil aspects, any country that would apply the civil aspects would be very wise, and they could uh, really lower their crime rate if they did, but they're not following that. America started that way, but no longer. So they are right there in verse 14. It is the customs that are changing, not the rest. Okay, the customs. Now Stephen was filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 15, and all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So, wow, that's quite a thing. The countenance was shining because he knew God was speaking through him. He had a fullness of the Spirit. He knew he was right. He knew he had the power of God. And now he's going to speak to these people. Uh, they could see it on his face. And it's amazing. I mean, when you listen, uh, you go elsewhere. I think my mom had a funny experience with church while we were gone. What kind of a church was it? A community run by a bunch of women. <laughs> and she just was saying it was really comical. Technically very sad. Very sad what's going on in the churches. And that's because they're not studying and you could tell the, the man or the woman behind the pulpit in most cases don't believe what they're saying. You could hear it through their words. Okay, it's about like a Catholic priest going, Hail Mary, Mother of our, help us in our hour of our need. I wonder if the Cubs are going to win today. <laughs> Did you see that one clip of that Lutheran guy? I think it was a Lutheran guy before the Super Bowl. And uh, he was uh, he was some one of the fans, and he says we're going to cut this service very short this morning. He said all your sins are forgiven thee, and ran out and said let's go whoever he was shooting for, and ran, went out the door to watch the game. He didn't care. He don't care about. I mean, at any time he don't care about it because he don't believe it. Okay, and so that's an amazing thing. Okay, that's chapter six, and we'll go into Stephen's. Uh, words that he's going to give. Okay, any questions or comments? Are we